Hi, everyone. My name is David Liu, and I'm a data science and AI solutions engineer at Intel. Today, I'd like to talk to you about data science performance and why it might not be what you think. As an overview of what we're going to talk about today, we'll first start with the current state of data science hardware and the most critical phases of the data science process. After that, we'll talk about benchmarking and what other types of hardware features can actually affect data science performance. Then we'll talk about software and how I built the data science products based on this information. Let's first take a look at the current state of data science hardware. One of the most common complaints between data scientists and IT is they say, you never get me the system I want or need. This rift between data scientists and IT has seemed to exist for the last part of 10 years. And the question is why? Systems available on the market always seem to run out of memory, and many are skewed towards AI production and filled with GPUs, which may not be a good match for data science. In addition to that, cloud offerings don't necessarily hit the mark with the way that the data scientists do their work today. The resultant effect is that many of the systems available today are inspired by non-practitioners, which means you get many of the systems created by buzzword-based hardware and mismatched system requirements. Examples of these are workstation offerings without enough memory for data sets and cloud instances which have non-contiguous memory. Other areas where you get on-prem servers that are just borrowed from their other uses and not necessarily specialized for data science work. As we try to evaluate where the most critical phases of the data science process is, one thing comes to mind. Where is all the time spent during the data science process? One place we can look to is Anaconda's 2021 survey from data scientists across the globe. And one thing that comes out in their survey is that well over 80% of the data science process is spent during what we consider the pre-processing and visualization stages, places that really aren't in training or inference. So how does one actually optimize a hardware system to get better data science performance? One of the ways of evaluating where this performance can come from is by looking at benchmarking. By evaluating what types of workloads are in the data science space, one might gain additional insight into what's really going on. My past experiences with benchmarking, something strange popped up where certain workstations were actually beating servers on machine learning benchmarks or even laptops beating out cloud instances. So that kind of got me thinking, well, what else? can I actually use to evaluate where this performance is coming from? And we have a, an interesting product which allows you to evaluate where this is, and that's Intel's VTune amplifier. And I started using this instrumentation tool to evaluate uh, the different types of workloads and what type of hardware implications were happening under the hood of many of the data science workloads. Based on the results of this test, it helped me locate what type of hardware and software features to pivot my eventual tests on. Running the test revealed a few insights. When evaluating where the time was spent, it was interesting because a lot of it was the CPython interpreter or the actual frameworks that were holding the majority of the percentage hotspots, i.e. where it is spending the most time and compute power. But that isn't the full story. Once you exit the Python interpreter and go into a framework or runtime, the story changes significantly. Then the optimized code seems to shift around its bottlenecks into the linear algebra calls that are held in runtimes. And those runtimes are heavily affected by AVX speeds and vary more than core count. Next, let's talk about the strange behavior of how my laptop beat out a cloud instance. On several experiments that I ran when I was still running the iBench benchmark, I experienced situations where my laptop, a Core i9, beat out some of the cloud instances when it should have been running faster than the laptop. This readily happened with the NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, and Scikit-Learn test quite often. And it was kind of a ping pong effect of both the laptop occasionally beating the cloud instance and then back and forth. And this behavior was very strange to me. And what I discovered when I dug in a little deeper is that there's an issue with the way that cloud does their provisioning of instances. And these instances and their behavior of how they're provisioned can highly affect the performance of the system itself and any subsequent benchmark. What's actually happening at the end of the day is what's called a split VM or a moving virtual machine problem. And the issue with this is that when a cloud instance is provisioned, one's compute can actually be non-contiguous, i.e. a virtual machine can actually be in two places on two different systems, unbeknownst to the user, although it's presented as one. This causes a very unequal length path of the data set array, both having latency implications and data transport requirements, creating a situation where 
uh, quote unquote, network pneuma can essentially decimate the performance of frameworks and runtimes for data science, machine learning, deep learning, and other AI frameworks. I've drawn a few diagrams to try to help explain the situation. The top image shows your preferred setup where your instance lands on a single node and all the memory is contiguous to that system. The bottom image is what usually happens in which your memory and data set are split across multiple nodes. And this creates very unusual behavior in terms of latency and data transport requirements. And again, they present to you that you get one singular instance, but in reality, underneath the hood, it's actually multiple instances. The only way to really get around this is to have a bare metal or virtual private cluster system for this to not happen, as that basically prevents this type of VM migration or splitting from occurring. Next, let's look at the topics of core count, vectorization, and the curse of NUMA. The interplay between these three aspects have great implications in data science benchmarks and workloads. Core count really runs itself up against two major limits. The first is algorithmic and the other is thermal. Vectorization, on the other hand, has a lot to do with data science and machine learning work, but its frequency is gated again by the core count thermals from the previous item. Next, you have the issue of NUMA, which becomes problematic in a few areas when you get core-to-core -core NUMA and network-based NUMA. Let's talk first about core count. Core count's real problems start with the dual algorithm scaling properties that really affect it and gate it. And this is very much true for the algorithms of classical machine learning and stats that are used in data science. Many of the algorithms hit Omdahl's law of parallelism very early because the number of times they must iterate over very similar elements or the same array elements, and they're semi-blocking each other. The other aspect of this is oversubscription, in which there are too many threads given to the resources that are actually available, and this gets amplified with nested parallelism that is inherent within many of the data science frameworks in the space. Additionally, too many cores also reduces the overall clock speed as each core takes up a specific cost to the silicon in both power and heat dissipation, mostly related to the packaging properties of silicon and the thermal limits of the processor. Next, let's talk about the topic of vectorization. Because much of the machine learning and deep learning space rely on vectorization-based math, one can run into issues where the AVX2 and AVX512 speeds can influence performance more than base clock speed. Because the AVX2 and AVX512 speeds are usually independent of the base clock speed, one needs to pay special attention to what type of speeds there are available on one specific processor. Additionally, because instructions like AVX move to a different power state when invoked, the low to mid core count, somewhere around 12 to 40 cores, perform better than processors with higher core count, i.e. those that are above 40 cores. Because of these attributes, AVX 512 ends up being the strongest indicator of machine learning, deep learning, and AI performance on the CPU. Second behind that is AVX 2 speeds. For the next part of my investigation, I chose a few benchmarking systems that I would use to either represent the systems that were common in the space or ones that I thought might actually do well. I selected a two socket 56 core system to represent what is commonly seen in the space, then a single socket 18 core system, then moving to the desktop style processors, 16 core and 18 core Xeon Ws, and then finally a Core i9 to represent what most of us have in our laptops. Next, let's take a look at what happened during the benchmarks of these systems. One very interesting property that seemed to reveal itself is that the mid-core systems, those 12 to 40 cores, seem to perform better than even the two-socket systems. And during these NumPy and SciPy tests, this was repeated many times across many functions. The ones circled here are both 18 core systems and they routinely beat out either lower or higher core systems with relative ease. This is tied to the attribute that each of these parts have extremely high AVX512 speeds at their core count. And because of this, they operate much quicker during these vectorized instructions. Another interesting aspect here shown on this diagram is the core i9 that was actually tested beat out a two socket system because of its extremely high AVX2 speeds. So again, we're starting to see a good correlation as to what types of hardware attributes lead to good 
numerical and data science performance. On the scikit-learn benchmarks, something quite similar occurred, where these mid-core systems, i.e. anywhere between 12 to 40 cores, seem to do extremely well to their other industry-popular counterparts. This repeated itself in both training and inference properties, so it seems to be tied heavily towards both the AVX performance and the oversubscription properties of too many cores. While this was true of many of the scikit-learn algorithms, some did indeed scale with cores. But this brings into the point of why it's important to understand the algorithms and how they scale. Next, let's talk about the topic of NUMA and network NUMA. NUMA stands for Non-Uniform Memory Access. NUMA can affect algorithm behavior quite severely, in which calculations that involve entire rows, columns, or full data frames can induce large latencies when doing either memory access, memory transfer, or algorithm convergence. One way to alleviate some of the issues of NUMA is to choose a single socket system over a multi-socket system if available. This should prevent at least the CPU-based NUMA from becoming an issue this early on. Network NUMA, on the other hand, describes the issue of having to get either data or direct memory access through the network itself. This can occur in a multi-node situation or through an RDMA call. Because the network is generally slower than local memory, the type of latency induced by network NUMA is relatively severe. Next, let's talk about distributed framework behavior. Now, an interesting part is that Dask and Ray, which are part of many of the distributed frameworks that are used in the space, do a pretty good job for many data science tasks, but they have a limited subset of the API that they support, i.e. a Dask data frame versus a full Pandas data frame. In addition to that, they're also subject to the network NUMA that I discussed in the previous slide. After researching all of these properties of how data science workloads can work across different types of hardware and configurations, I came up with a bit of a performance hierarchy guide. The guide is ranged from most preferred to least preferred top to bottom. So at the very top, you have a single socket workstation or system with a higher memory capacity, one that can fit your entire data set or large portion of the data set in memory. Next is a multi-socket single node system that can also try to do the same thing. After that is the bare metal cloud instance in which I was speaking about before. The bare metal or virtual private cloud instance is one that you can land on that does not have any other shared resources or is able to be moved. The last one is a traditional cloud instance which might have a VM split or migration issue. Next, let's talk about the topic of software behavior and framework optimization. As an aspect of the Python and SciPy ecosystem, there represents a unique property, tiered performance layers that exist within each layer of the SciPy stack. The Python or CPython layer, where the global interpreter lock is located, or the GIL, represents the first layer. This is the side, if you're using basic Python, that you're going to be utilizing and stuck within. It's majority single-threaded. Most data scientists' work goes through this because many of the frameworks are written in Python. Once you exit the Python layer, you're in the framework layer. This is where the majority of data science frameworks sit, such as NumPy, SciPy, and Scikit-Learn. The majority of the code written in this layer is Python, C, and occasionally some Fortran. After this, you'll hit the runtime layer, in which runtimes such as OpenBloss, 1MKL, 1DNN, and 1DAL, i.e. those that are dependent on the domain will be accessed and has much of the code written in C, LLVM, or a lower level such as assembly. Why don't we take a look at this in the context of a NumPy call? When you first enter this call with NumPy, you are presented with Python and the function goes through CPython first and then exits the gil afterwards into NumPy. Once you're in NumPy, it's accessing some Python and some C and then afterwards, it makes a dispatch to a runtime. After that, you're free of the API limitations within NumPy and some of its performance implications. And then you move into a runtime like the math kernel library. This can occasionally get around some of the bottlenecks that are inherent in the frameworks above. 
And then this is the lowest level of abstraction of where the performance is. As you can see, anytime you do use a NumPy, SciPy, or say scikit-learn call, you are really inducing three different layers no matter what you do. Next, let's look at the software behavior of the SciPy ecosystem. NumPy and SciPy are very vectorization driven as they rely primarily on the OpenBloss API that one MKL and Fortran help facilitate. Thus, they scale well with AVX2 and AVX512, and it scales okay with core count. Scikit-learn, XGBoost, and other machine learning and deep learning frameworks also scale well with AVX2 and AVX512, and they scale okay with cores up until the point where they oversubscribe or hit nested parallelism issues, which is usually about up to 40 cores. Pandas, on the other hand, is majority AVX2, as it doesn't have that many AVX512 commands. And it's also highly dependent on your single threaded core speed because of the global interpreter lock that it normally incurs when using some of the functions. After that, any subsequent function within pandas then is subject to NumPy and SciPy behavior because much of pandas is built on NumPy and SciPy. At the base runtime level, without any of the frameworks above, it scales quite well with AVX2 and AVX5 tell speeds, with a secondary scaling with core count. In summary, software has a large role to play in the performance characteristics of data science workloads. If you notice, the interplay between data science software and compute hardware really changed the hardware choices that I used to test out these different systems. While software can solve some of the computing challenges of data science, the implications of the algorithm's data movement still heavily affect the hardware. Next, I took a look at our hardware lineup to see if there's any type of technologies that could benefit the field of data science. When looking at technologies, I asked myself the following three questions. If memory capacity is in locality is so important, then what products could improve the behavior? In addition to looking at memory, what other advantages could be provided by the different CPU lines? And how can a mix of the two solve for a data science workload? When looking at the product lines, I focused in on one particular product, Intel Optane Persistent Memory, which could actually be run in memory mode to add to the existing memory pool. Because of how large these memory modules are, you can get up to 4.5 or 6 terabytes per socket depending on the Xeon generation and Optane generation you use in that single socket. So this technology could solve the memory problems when used on a Xeon SP grade workstation. In the scope of memory solutions, this hits a few key areas very well. First, it is a single socket, single node memory solution. And this is the core issue of data science performance. It's really good if the data set fits into memory. From a memory capacity standpoint, it's fantastic because of the larger sizes versus standard DRAM. Next is the issue of memory locality. By reducing the round trips and NUMA-esque things that can happen, by fitting it all on a single node, this memory solution allows you to alleviate some of the memory locality problems. Lastly, Intel Optane Persistent Memory could actually change the data science space quite drastically by allowing for this very dense single node and single socket memory. Taking in all the lessons I had from the previous experiments that I ran, I really wanted to move this forward by building a data science solution for the masses. I felt that the key learnings that I had discovered from these investigations would lead to systems that data scientists would want to use. The first thing I did was evaluate which Intel CPUs would fit the bill for this mid-core high AVX 512 speed requirement. After that, I looked for a CPU that would fit in each form factor, laptop, desktop, and full-size tower segments. I then arranged the price performance segments based upon memory capacity and then went into testing system configurations to try to find good systems for each segment. For the laptop form factor below 128 gigabytes, I used a Core i9 equipped with a decent core count, about 6 to 12 cores, and a high AVX2 clock speed. The advantage of this configuration is that many consumer grade laptops do fit this bill. For the standard desktop, I chose the Xeon W parts as they have higher AVX 512 speeds than the Xeon SP because they don't have to be 24 seven server rated. I also used a target of about 18 to 28 cores for these designs. For the full size workstation, I chose to use the Xeon SP part as it has the capacity to use the Optane persistent memory modules. I also chose parts that had 18 to 28 cores like the systems above. 
Next, I worked with our OEM and channel partners to bring these systems to market to be made generally available. As said before, software is a key aspect of getting data science performance. And one of the things that we did do is make sure that our Intel One API AI Analytics Toolkit is both available for pre-install and download with some of these designs, granting the necessary data science tools you would need out of the box. In addition to that, more work is being done with future systems and CPUs to further develop the data science line of products at Intel. With the launch of the Intel-based data science workstation, we started working with our OEM partners to change some of their designs to bring the Intel-based solutions to market. Over the next year, Lenovo, HP, and Dell will all be bringing systems to market that are based on the Intel Data Science Workstation. Additionally, I've also put together a video on how I built my own personal data science system. This is available on YouTube and it's called Designing a Data Science Workstation Part 1, and there's more videos to come in that series as well. In summary, data science performance is more complicated than just looking at core count or accelerators. Really changing from the market sentiment, it is actually memory capacity bound. For pre-processing and other statistical tools of data science, they are highly sensitive to algorithm scaling limits and hardware topology. This is why a mid-core count, anywhere between 12 to 40 cores, usually does better than a high core count. Additionally, optimizing for AVX 512 and AVX 2 speeds and reducing NUMA are the key to better compute behavior for your data science workloads. And with our OEM partners and the learnings that we got from this investigation, hopefully more systems like this will be coming in the future. Thanks for coming to my talk and see you next time.